Hi, I'm Femi OK, and join the stream today, hip hop star Taleb Kweli. He's here to answer your questions about music, activism, and the unexpected result of the US presidential election. Yeah. We sell crack to our own out the back of our homes. We smell the musk of the dusk and the crack of the dawn. We go through episodes too, like attack of the clones. What till we break a bag and you hear the crack of the bone to get by? Talib Kweli is among the pioneers of conscious rap, known for his lyrical talent and political messages. But what helps set him apart from other artists is a willingness to turn his acclaimed words into action. Police are supposed to serve and protect. Who are they serving? Who are they protecting? Too often it ain't us. We as young black people, men, women, and children, are told that our, our lives mean nothing. And right. it fits very nicely into the narrative of this country since slavery and, and beyond. They want to know what the end game is? You want to know what the end game is? This is the end game. This is the end game. I don't think, you know, especially at an organization like CNN, I don't think the intention is to not be fair or balanced. But we live in a world that's, that's run by, by white supremacy, and that's the narrative, of the narrative and, and language of the oppressors taking over. With both music and activism, Quayley has helped fans around the world make sense of political realities. So one day after a shocking U.S. election outcome, Talib Quayley is right here in the stream. Talib, great to have you. Also joining the conversation, we have two guests at the forefront of hip-hop and politics. Jeff Chang is a hip-hop historian and the author of We Gonna Be Alright, Notes on Race and Resegregation. And Rosa Clemente is a hip-hop activist and journalist. She was the Green Party's vice presidential candidate in 2008. Guests, thanks so much for being part of this program. Hip hop, culture, politics, what order are they in for you, Talib, today? What's the most important uh, that's resonating with you right now? Um, well, first, I want to say um, it's my honor and my pleasure to be on the program. It's also my honor and my pleasure to be here with guests like Jeff and Rosa, who are people who have been uh, in my life and on this journey, on this hip hop journey with me, on this activism journey with me, since I first started my career back in the raucous days, I've traveled the world, you know, with, with, with Rosa, you know, me and Jeff, we've been doing our thing for a long time. Um, and I think that they would agree with me um, when I say that hip hop culture and politics is all the same thing. Uh -huh. um, hip hop, you can't separate it from the struggle. Hip hop is directly influenced by the pain and by the struggle of people of color, and it it made it, in, it made it into something musical. It made it into something corporate that could be easily commodified and sold, so sometimes people get it confused and twisted and think that hip hop is supposed to just be about turning up and partying, but anybody who really knows hip hop, like the people you have on this, on this panel, the people uh -huh. you have on this program, they know what, what the deal is. Rosa, for you, for today, um, when you're thinking about what's happened, how do you unpack that? How do you make it make sense? I mean, as a trained historian and as a hip hop activist and, and really understanding that hip hop is the voice of, not the voiceless, but the voice of the marginal, um, the marginalized, uh, that, you know, look, I'm not surprised that Donald Trump's the president. I'm not surprised that we went from a president, a black president to a president that was supported by the KKK, just understanding the history of the United States of America. Um, so I think what hip hop does for all of us is it consistently recenters us in our politic. Um, it, it makes us, some of us, very consistent, consistent in our politic of what we want for our people, which is true freedom and liberation. And that you can't separate hip hop culture. It's not just an add-on identity for some of us. It's how we actually view and see our lives and how we filter a lot of things and a lot of nonsense out of that to have a strict politics. Jeff, I'm just wondering, how much engagement did you see of hip-hop artists during this very long presidential campaign? Well, a lot. And I think, you know, the long kind of play of this is to, to, to think about a lot of the activism that was happening in the late 90s, you know, around the turn of the millennium when a lot of us were coming up um, and trying to make our politics visible, trying to change the culture and, and move the country. Um, and I think what we've seen is, is that we were successful in doing that. And the Trump election in so many ways is a backlash directly to the kinds of gains that we've made. Um, you know, uh, all the folks here 
Taleb, Rosa, and the, the millions of folks uh, that we are standing with, um, that's what the, the election has been about. But, you know, at the same time, what we saw is a lot of folks participating, I think, um, over the years, over the last two decades, um, in different ways of trying to make things known. And now it takes um, the, the sort of show of everything from the movement for black lives to what's happening at Standing Rock, the undocumented movement, as well as the uh, electoral uh, political process that some folks have been involved in um, all of these years. Uh, and across the board, you've seen you know, uh, folks on the ground to celebrities like Cube and, and Big Boy tweeting yesterday about getting out to vote. Uh, so this is like, make no mistake, this is, this is uh, a culture war and it's being waged against uh, those of us who I think represent a future, a transformative future for America. Guess, have a listen to this. This is one of our community called Reham Osman and she raised a question. I know a lot of people are asking this. Have a listen to what she wants to talk to you about. I'm interested in knowing what kind of role you think race had to play in this election cycle. Um, although Donald Trump's call to want to ban all Muslims and his claim that he would build a wall took center stage, just last week we saw that a black church was burned down and uh, vandalized um, and it was spray painted and it said, vote Trump. So I'm interested in knowing what do you think are the grievances that are typically held by Trump supporters? Riam, do you want to, that's Riam's the thoughts. Grievances? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do you I want to start, Reza? It's not, it's not grievances. These are people that believe in the system of white supremacy. Absolutely. These are people that want us either dead, deported, incarcerated, or contained in our communities. And I think for me, that's where actually hip hop politics failed in this election cycle. See, everybody in hip hop has the right to their own politics. But most of the artists, unless they were people like Kuali or Rebel Diaz or Immortal Technique or um, um, just other people, they were on the Hillary Clinton bandwagon. And what people don't realize is that Hillary Clinton and the Democratic policies have also been destructive to many people of color in this country. So her, the, the Democratic Party is the failure as well as a Republican implosion or maybe explosion that is built on white supremacy. But the Democratic Party also built itself on welfare reform, mass incarceration and racist policies in our community. See, Talib, you, you get into it on your Twitter page. People go to uh, at Talib Kweli and you can see how much he gets into it with people who want to debate with him. I pull one up. This is from the last couple of hours. This one is from David J. Wagner. Uh, and he, he, he says to you, just because the truth about the DNC is good news to the KKK sympathizers doesn't make the source racist. You respond, you just defended the Confederate flag and said white nationalists aren't white supremacists. You're a Nazi. Nazi. You get straight in there. <laughs> why, why, why are you engaging? That, that's the kind of tweet that I would go, I'm moving on. You, you're, you're in there. You're debating. Why? Why is that important to you? Well, I mean, I have to acknowledge that people come to my Twitter page because they know I'm going to respond. I respond more than most celebrities. So, right. so people come because they know there's a good chance I might respond. Look, I enjoy the conversation. I, Rosa knows this very well. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I enjoy the debate. So I enjoy being able to make a make a statement and back it up with fact um and with that debate in particular it's talking a lot about the wikileaks situation where i'm noticing connections i'm noticing that the trump campaign was taken over by steve bannon and the breitbart crew i'm noticing how breitbart has invented this whole this term alt right to get us distracted away from talk about the white supremacy that has taken over politics i'm noticing that wikileaks has has put out all this information on the DNC, which uh, WikiLeaks has a, a record of being factual. The, 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 you don't see emails from WikiLeaks that you can question the content of the email. But what happens is you have sites like Infowars and Breitbart that take these facts that WikiLeaks and then they draw conclusions based on these facts and then they present their conclusions as facts. And then you have uh, WikiLeaks who claims to be partisan or, you know, claims to not be partisan, retweeting Infowars, retweeting Breitbart, which are clearly white supremacist sites. They're retweeting these conclusions they come to. So if, if you're all about information, you're all about transparency, why would you retweet or elevate a support 
a, a white supremacist voice? To me, that's a question that I have. I asked that question and WikiLeaks tweeted me. They took the time to tweet me and say, you know, you shouldn't be asking those questions, but they never questioned their support from David Duke. They never answered the question about why they're retweeting sites like Breitbart. So right. to me, I just think that we have to vet our sources better and know where we're getting information from. The, the biggest problem I've seen with this campaign is people accept uh, lies and people accept propaganda as fact just on the surface, you have black people who are spreading around links from white supremacist websites as if it's fact. It's insane to me. I'm just going to say that. Tell her, I have a question for you, actually. Can yeah, I ask yeah, a question yeah, for yeah, 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 go, go ahead. I'm uh, Jeff, let me just curious. say for, for people watching outside of, of the country, Breitbart is part of the very conservative media in the United States. If you're watching around the world, that's what Talib was referencing. Jeff, go ahead, please. Yeah, and I think that, that what's amazing about, uh, you know, Talib, your stand on social media is being able to call this stuff out. But I'm, I'm really curious for both of you, what do you think the role of social media has been in developing uh, the Trump candidacy and the, and the backlash that we're seeing across the country? And also this idea of these falsehoods and how easily they can be spread. I think that the, um, for a long time, the alt-right and the white supremacist contingency has been working very hard uh, on, on owning that space. When you think about, it's a lot of communities. It's a new atheist community that's imperialist and wants to kill all Muslims. It's a white nationalist community. It's a Nazi community. You have um, people who are anime fans. You have gamers. You had Gamergate. You have all these different communities that align under this banner, and they've been very successful at changing the narrative online and pushing a lot of BS and a lot of misinformation to the forefront. Um, I think they've been far more successful than any of the politicians. I think they've been far more successful than the, the left wing uh, of our country, the, than the progressive, the liberals that have a lot of catching up to do in terms of breaking through this wall of misinformation that's purposefully disseminated. There's a lot of blame that's going around right now about, well, if you'd only voted or if you'd voted, if you'd be more engaged. Let me just show you how engaged Talib is if you don't know his activism here. This is a, one article that he wrote, and he talks about from Ferguson to Freedom Hip Hop's role, very involved in the Black Lives Movement. And then this comment here from PJ says, Talib, I think the civil disturbances caused by the Black Lives Matter movement pushed moderates into the Trump camp. What do you think about that? I think that if, um, if you saw someone stand up and say Black Lives Matter and it made you want to vote Trump, Black Lives never matter to you. You just needed an excuse. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a, a horrible excuse. I also think for so many people in the United States right now to blame people who didn't vote, to try to blame some of the Latinos and African Americans that did vote for Trump, what about the 52% of white college educated women that voted for Trump, the 60% mm -hmm. of non-college educated white women that voted for Trump when he's a sexual assaulter, a misogynist, a patriarch. Everyone right now is blaming everything but the system of white supremacy as well as the mainstream media. Yeah, CNN, I'd like to add on to that. MSNBC I'd like to add on. are worse than Fox News are. $2 billion worth of free coverage, as well as never having journalistic integrity to actually vet both candidates properly and marginalize third party candidates. And that's where, for me, the blame lies. I totally agree with Rosa on that, especially with the part about mainstream media. Um, the vetting of the candidates was horrible. Uh, elevating this reality TV star to the level of even being talked about as a serious candidate, I couldn't believe it mm -hmm. when I saw it. People were doing it for ratings, but now this, this, this is on their hands. Uh, Talib, um, personal question. Did you vote? I did vote. Okay, because you are notoriously known for not necessarily voting, being engaged, but not necessarily voting. What made you go to vote this time? Um, I'll be honest with you. Um, I decided that I was going to vote at the last minute. Um, oh. I decided I was going to vote on election day. I didn't endorse any candidate. I spoke often about Donald Trump for reasons that Rosa has outlined. I definitely did not endorse Hillary Clinton. But I do look at the realities on the ground, and I look at where we're at as a country. And, I, uh, you know, to quote, to paraphrase Bernie Sanders, who is a politician that um, I have a lot more respect for than, than the, the candidates that we had, mm -hmm. um, you look at the moment where you're at now, and it may not be the moment that you want it to be at. 
You know, I would have preferred to see a green candidate or a progressive candidate or even a Bernie Sanders, but that's not what we had. You had one candidate uh, in the two-party system uh, and the way that our electoral college work, you had one candidate who had a chance to beat Donald Trump. And so even though I knew that Hillary Clinton was going to win New York, I personally feel like my vote doesn't count in New York because of how the electoral college is set mm -hmm. up so that rich white men could get the most votes, their votes could count the most. But I, I wanted to have a symbolic vote against Donald Trump. I didn't want Donald Trump to be president and me say I didn't at least have a symbolic vote. I want to be clear to say to that that for me it is a symbolic vote. I think that if I lived in a different state, my vote would not be as symbolic. Um, but I followed the lead of Bernie Sanders. I looked at his ex political experience. I looked at what he was going to do. And I said, I'm going to trust his decision. And I'm going to cast my vote for Hillary Clinton. Let me share something what with you. This goes back to August the 19th in Michigan on the campaign trail. This is Donald Trump talking about African Americans. Just have a quick listen. Look how much African American communities have suffered under Democratic control. To those I say the following, what do you have to lose by trying something new like Trump? What do you have to lose? You're living in poverty. Your schools are no good. You have no jobs. 58% of your youth is unemployed. What the hell do you have to lose? Jeff, I want you to pick up here, but via something that you tweeted out just recently, you said, don't mourn, organize, don't despair, create. As a hip hop historian, in times of turbulence where the nation is split, where there are many, many issues, what happens to the music? Does it get better? Does it get more antagonistic? What happens to hip hop? Well, I think we've seen what's happened to hip hop over the last two, three years mm. is uh, a lot of other artists, a lot of younger artists have moved in the direction that Talib's been working in for, you know, the longest time. Um, that you're looking at folks addressing these issues that have been raised uh, by artists in the past, um, as well as the movement. I think that there's a dialectic that's kind of opened up between the movement for Black Lives um, and the artists who are, are recording. There's a shift that's been happening and it's resulted in amazing music um, but also stuff that's really getting to the heart of where we need to be I think um, as a country uh, as communities uh, in the world uh, so for me you know it's really interesting to see uh, like Beyonce and Solange you know taking seriously the movement for black lives and writing music uh, that encourages us, us to think about different forms mm -hmm. uh, of justice uh, different kinds of ways that we can think about this and and the, I want to make one more point too which comes from uh, the earlier conversation that y'all were having about um, this particular tweet, right, in which somebody's talking about, like, well, it's the movement for black lives that caused this backlash. Mm -hmm. The irony and the tragedy of this is that the movement for black lives platform, the agenda, is the, the very thing that will set a lot of these alienated, these uh, pushed down, these economically dislocated whites free as well. Um, and, and so... It's a culture war, and, and I think that artists play a super crucial role mm. in being able to, to challenge um, the kinds of uh, things that the other side is doing in order to keep us divided. Talib, there's a question that's just come in from you. It's from I Am Griffix, and uh, I Am Griffix says, what advice would you give to young people frustrated and fearful about their future with President-elect Trump? Well... I'm still pondering that question oh. as, as we speak now. Yeah. I, I would like to offer young people and my children an apology. Um, you know, I feel mm. really, really, really bad as a citizen of America, as a taxpayer. Um, you know, I feel bad that we have done so poorly that we mm. have allowed our country to get to this point. I, I feel bad that this is the world that we're handing to this generation. Um, this is on all of us, you know, I, it, it, no matter how many Twitter trolls I, I, I tweet against, it's <laughs> on me too, mm. you know, um, and I just, you know, it's like what, J what Jeff has said is about, you know, about organizing, um, you know, what, 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 what people, with what activists like Rosa do, we do the work on November 9th and November 10th and November 11th, the crew I roll with, we are 
in these streets doing this activist work, whether it's on CNN or not, whether it's on the news or not, whether news cameras around or not, I try to align myself with activists who are just there all the time. Um, and that's how I, you know, the language is, remains fluid. And uh, if you don't, if you don't pay attention, to what's going on in the activist community, um, you're going to get lost in the sauce, and you don't really have a right to talk about it. You don't really have, a, unless you're participating in some sort of direct action, some sort of activism, some sort of um, community-based work. Your critique is not warranted, it's not informed, and it's not uh, respected. Let me just show people your tour schedule coming up. You're working for the next couple of nights in Brooklyn, and then you head uh, across to Lisbon and Paris and Lyon and Antwerp and Dublin. Goes on and on. Lots of dates in the yeah, UK. Yeah, it's the um, it's the I'm um, out of America tour. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're, you're going to be. You, you, <laughs> I'm not uh, coming back. I'm on tour for the next oh, four years. Oh, I'm glad you're I'm glad you're laughing. All right. We need you, brother. You got, so, I know, I know. That was a that was a joke. <laughs> I'll be back, but right. I'm I'm definitely. I'm definitely like, you know, um, yeah, man, it's, it's the, my, my gut reaction, like a lot of people, is to want to leave. But uh -huh. I know, I am blessed. I was able to go to Ferguson with Rosa because I'm an artist, I get to decide my schedule. I, I have celebrity privilege, I have academic privilege, I have a lot of privileges that allow me to move how I wanna move. So if I wanted to, I could just get up and be out. But what about everybody else who gotta live in this? You know, I, I, I can't just get up and be out. All right, so, so listen to this. This is, this is an interesting question here about international hip-hop artists and U.S. ones. What will be the relationship between America hip-hop artists with international hip-hop artists after this election? So now, Well, the beautiful what's thing about hip-hop and, 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 and black arts in general and black people in America in general is we've always been the collective conscious of this nation. Mm. We have always been the standard-bearer for, for, you know, our America's moralistic fiber. Um, when you look at, you know, people of color, whether it's black people, Latino people, Asian people, Native Americans, look at what they were saying five years before the country switched over. And, you know, maybe with the, with the exception of gay marriage and certain other things we're very conservative on, you know what I'm saying? But we, we, we have been the, the, the consciousness. And hip-hop as a culture, throughout, no matter, you know, what happens, hip-hop always... Hip hop is the greatest um, connector, the greatest unifying force that our planet has ever seen. Uh. Hip hop has united more people of races, creeds, colors than any anything. is a beautiful thing. Um, me as an ambassador of hip hop culture, I get spoiled, um, and I think that me, as an ambassador of hip hop's culture, I was spoiled to the point where I didn't see this coming. I was shocked. I'm d d shocked and embarrassed by America. I didn't think Trump had a shot. When Rosa says, I knew, it's because she was visiting in those colleges. When my homeboy, Seth Bird, who's a plumber, he says, he, I knew, because he was dealing with working class people. I'm traveling the world doing shows and nightclubs, dealing with hip hop as a celebration, dealing with people who, are, who don't have these attitudes, dealing with people who have grown out of uh, racism and bigotry and recognize their privilege. So I now have to check myself because I'm connected to the people. Y'all did a whole montage about how connected I am to the people, mm. but I'm not as connected as I Whoa. thought I was for me to be. Is this a, wa this is a wake up call for you? Wake up call yeah, for your work? Yeah, because I'm like, yo, I I'm traveling in these circles and I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist, mm. definitely. Like I believe in the power of the human spirit. Yeah. I wouldn't be an artist if I, if I wasn't. I, I do this out of love. Sure. I, I look at all these racist trolls, you see me on Twitter, I do this out of love, man, but <laughs> I, I have to really, really, really reevaluate how I was approaching and how I was moving, sure. because Talib, I think I maybe was showing people too much love. Talib, we, we are going to go to our post shows. I'm going to get everybody to go from wherever they're watching to stream.outazero.com. We're going to pick up the conversation with Talib and Rosa and Jeff and you as well, stream.outazero.com. I'm going to play a track out, though, Talib. I try. In a sentence, what do we need to know about that track, I try? Shout out to John Legend. He's been stellar when it comes to holding down the people. He wrote this. Mm -hmm. Kanye West on the beat, Mary J. Blige. I Try is a record that's very important to my career. And um, you know what? I've grown out of the I Try mentality, to be honest with you. Now I'm yeah. more an I Do person. You All know right. what I'm saying? But, mm -hmm. but um, I yeah, try I Try to, is I very do. All yeah, right. I Try is a very important record. Tally Quayley, to be continued. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care. Breath of life, kiss of death, my lips purse the same. You flirt till she came, nothing hurt like the pain and torture. Daughters of the dust, looking for a thing, something to take a thing like the Lord's name. Put your hands together, got a more thing.
Hello again, I'm glad you found us online. This is the online post show with uh, Talib Crowley and also Jeff Chang and also Rosa Clemente. Thank you guys for coming back and staying for the online part. Uh, this, this came in as we were all talking from Culture Fix. The beautiful thing about music is that collaborations can continue across borders regardless of who the president is. Are you finding that comforting, Rosa? Well, I mean, I have to say I, I disagree a little with my brothers on, on, on some of the political um, work around, you know, artists in particular uh the musicians in, in hip-hop culture i really do think it's important um what the politic is right and i i think that as well is we have to realize the organizing moment that that we're in right now and that at this very moment less than 12 hours after the president is elected there are people in this country who are so afraid they're undocumented people, Muslim people. They don't know what's going to happen in January. Like, all this stuff is important in relation to, like, even what happened with Brexit and, and what's happening internationally mm. where there is a, as Van Jones said yesterday eloquently on CNN, there is a white lash to black and brown progress, right? So, I mean, the one good thing about culture and social media is that the borders that exist the artificial borders are obviously broken down and that we have these conversations but i think we have to have a very clear analysis of what got us here so we never get here again i want to share this with you jeff um how will donald trump presidency affect the relationship with celebrity musicians that endorse hillary clinton i was watching their what they were hoping would be their victory party. Um, and there were lots of celebrities up there on stage watching at the watching party. Um, and I'm wondering whether does that, does that destroy their capital as an artist? Does it have any impact on them? What do you think? No, I don't think it destroys their capital. Um, what I think, and I, actually I, I agree with Rosa on this, um, that it, it does matter how artists are organized, that, that artists, um, do need to be strategic in terms of the way that they think about the role that they're playing in moving the discourse uh, forward and in opening up possibilities for transformational politics. Um, and you know, and I think that that the one thing that's that we didn't have when we were um, so so to go back right, go back to yeah. two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of artists that get involved. Uh, Obama gets elected. There was no infrastructure for us to be able to push uh, our particular kinds of issues. Um, now there is, right? And that's not necessarily uh, due be, to the be artists. Be specific, like um, our particular kind of issues. You're talking about things like the Black Lives Movement, gay yeah, marriage? Yeah, I think, you know, Are you talking about issues social media? Around, <coughs> we're talking about issues like incarceration, mass, right. you know, policing, the militarization right. of the police, yeah. um, the, the destruction of education, resegregation, all of these different types of issues that have impacted us uh, so deeply in our communities, there wasn't uh, an infrastructure, a mass infrastructure, to be able to push our points of view at that particular moment. And so, but there uh, was so Jeff. We, I no. mean, we had the we had the National Hip Hop Political Convention, and I think we can't erase what the convention created, and, and not on a mass level. I, I would agree with that with you. But we also had the Black August Hip Hop Project that was already five or six years deep. Mm -hmm. So I think what you said. Uh, just um, a second ago about how do then the artists become more politically radical and politically astute. I mean, the only thing that's uh, what's going to happen is they're not going to get invitations to the White House. All right. There's going to be no more <laughs> right. art commission. Right. Meetings. Over. There's gonna, yeah. Like that. That's over. Right? right. And and that is actually something we need to sit with politically that how did we allow ourselves for the last eight years to get caught up in the hype? Because listen, I'm the one that was the hip hop candidate in 2008 when I ran for vice president and I took that hip hop politic. But many people in the hip hop community and those that call themselves progressive and radical went right to the Democratic side. I don't just say the Obama side. So I think we have to just keep having what we're doing right now critical analysis even though we might have different political ideologies but we can't ever get caught up in their game again of of representation 
because it doesn't matter how well we're represented somewhere if the politics of our people are never at the center. Talim, let me throw this one at you. This one is online. This must be quite a novel experience for you because usually it's trolls yelling at you and these are people asking you for advice and, and admiring you. How yeah, are you? Is, well, I mean, hey, 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 let's, let's get it clear now. Yeah. I get a lot of love on Twitter. You too, do. Man. You get a lot of love on Twitter. <laughs> it's just that the engagement are with the trolls and you just, you don't give up. You just keep going. You know what it going. is? When people give me love, yeah. I say thank you and then the, I move the, on. the exchange is over. Yeah. When people say something that I disagree There's with, the exchange goes forth. on. and, and yeah. on, yeah. Um, and, and you, you you don't have a filter, you just say it how you feel. Uh, Soko asks you, how are you keeping other hip hop artists in check and woke? Um, that's not my job. I'm not these guys' parents, I'm not their keeper. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I participate in the culture is I try to lead by example. I, if I want to hear a conscious rap song, I don't complain that some other rapper's not making one, I just go and make one. And I try to make the one that I do so dope that and can't nobody question it. Um, no one is, peop as, as much as people don't like me, um, it's rare that people question my skill or my ability. So I've made being skillful, I've made my job of being an entertainer a priority so that when it's time for, it's time for me to be taken seriously, um, you know, that's not, that's not questioned. I, um, you know, I, I, um, Artists, artists are not, artists are not leaders, you know, artists are not, artists are, are followers, Art, artists want to be liked, artists want people to like them, and, um, you know, it's rare, the, 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 the artist that is the leader is the exception, not the rule, um, so I just try to celebrate artists like the ones that Rosa mentioned, the other artists like myself, and, um, excuse me, um, Amor Technique, Jasiri X, Rebel Diaz, Invincible, you know, other artists, Jessica Care Moore, other artists that, that go out there and really, really um, don't sacrifice the entertainment, but also understand that this culture comes from something that we have to uh, address. What are you working on right now? Um, I am working on, I just dropped a free mixtape called Awful People Are Great at Parties. Yeah, I've been, I, I was a, listening to that today. Oh, okay, I think it's a great title for this yeah. current uh, administration. Um, <laughs> and um, and I, I, have a new, I have a new record coming out. Um, I have a secret record that's going to drop in January that... You have a secret record that you just told us about? I have a about. secret record with a secret partner okay. that y'all are going to be very happy. But we're going to drop it for secret. But after right. that, I got a solo album. I got a lot of good things you in the You got pipe. a lot of stuff going. So, uh, political climate right now, how does that creep into your work? Does it? Um, yeah, I mean, my work is directly inspired by... Brooklyn is inspired by my parents, yeah. but it's inspired by these conversations that people are having. Mm. A, a lot of the stuff that I do on social network, um, it's, it's mental exercise for me. It's, it allows me to put my ideas out there as sort of as like beta, beta testing ideas before they, they, they land in my, my rhymes. I think that um, me engaging in these discussions on Twitter and knowing what people, knowing the criticisms of, of black culture, because like Jeff said, it is a culture war. Knowing the criticisms of our culture, knowing the personal criticisms people have of me has been very important um, in terms of being able to build up my debate skill, build up my ability to communicate better and get my ideas out better. Jeff, as okay. a hip hop historian, what is the most important question to be asking right now of another hip hop artist in the States at this time? Uh, how are you gonna be about the work, I think? And, I, and actually, I wanna kick this over to Rosa. What do you, Rosa, what do you think the work is right now? I mean, I think right now our immediate work is to defend Muslim and undocumented people. For those of us with extra privileges, which are not many, we got to be on the front lines of, of defending, not because folks can't defend themselves and not are <coughs> organizing, because the moment calls for complete clarity and solidarity. But the longer term mm. work is we have to organize and we have to stop thinking that the ballot will get us freedom. OK, we've had the ballot for less than 50 or 60 years in this country. And before that, all of us that have been marginalized and exploited have been doing the work and we have to continue to do the work. And if we are going to build on an electoral political system, the duopoly of the Democrats and Republicans has been shattered and we That's either right. need to build a third party like the Green Party or come together and build a new Rosa, Rosa, so interesting that you wanna, said that, because I just want to share this with you. It's almost as if you could see what was yeah. on my laptop. Uh, oh. Ali says, this should be the undeniable evidence that the Democratic and Republican oh. parties are far past their expiration dates. 
Just yeah, as you were saying, I was pulling that up. I'd just like to add in, you know, like I, you know, I cast my vote for Hillary Clinton. Uh, and what I just saw a report, 88% of black people of color, black people, 88% of us voted for Hillary Clinton. 100% of us could have voted for Hillary Clinton. It didn't matter. Uh, these didn't white matter. people, these, these white women, 52% like Rosa, they voted for Donald Trump. They voted against their interests. Um, so white is still majority in this country. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to raise politicians from the grassroots level. We have to have grassroots activist politicians. Um, you know, we, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, I agree with Rosa that you cannot blame progressives, you cannot blame the Green Party, people who wanted to vote for Jill Stein, even people who wanted to vote for Gary Johnson. Like, I, I didn't like Gary Johnson, but you can't, you can't blame those people um, because you, if you haven't been working to fix that system, um, if you haven't been working against the Electoral College, if you haven't been raising politicians in your community, you have, haven't been working to dismantle the two-party system, then it's, it's kind of too late to deal with it now. All right. Guess we could talk about this for, for hours um, and we're going to have another opportunity, many opportunities, um, and you can do that online with all of our guests. Jeff, I follow on Twitter. Rosa, I think I follow you. If I don't, I will in, in a nanosecond. Thank you, because uh, I follow you. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> I think I do, because I know what you're up to. Um, and, and Talib as well. I would just be, I'm, I'm a voyeur. I love watching you take on trolls. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation on this historic day after in the United States. Uh, take no care, doubt. everybody. We'll, we'll see you online. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care.